You're probably wondering how I got here. It started out as a beautiful morning on Lake Alexandrina. Equipped with solar panels, Starlink Mini satellite communications, and a pan tilt zoom camera, I set out to demonstrate whether an unlimited range remote control boat was possible. This boat had worked exceedingly well so far, successfully navigating around an island and visiting some shipwrecks. With Starlink connectivity, it already had effectively unlimited control and video range by routing everything through satellites in space. But this mission was far more ambitious. With the addition of solar panels, I expected the boat could operate effectively indefinitely. So I planned to circumnavigate Lake Alexandrina in South Australia, a distance of about 100 kilometers, over a series of days with the boat staying stationary overnight. I did have concerns about the design of the boat. It was already quite a top-heavy catamaran, with all the heavy equipment mounted well above the hulls. Adding the solar panels would make this even more top-heavy, plus they look vaguely like wings and might start acting like them in the wind. But nonetheless, this was the platform I had, and I just wanted to validate the idea that an infinite range remote control boat was even possible. So I set about designing the solar power system. I used a very useful PV Watts website to simulate an entire year's solar power output. Using a base system size of 200 watts, an angle of 0 degrees, i.e. placing the panels flat horizontally, and my current location, PV Watts produced a CSV of power output for every hour of the year. Here's an example of the PV Watts output for the first week of January versus the first week of July. It's clear that we get much more solar generation in January, which is the peak of the summer here in Australia. This makes sense due to the sun's higher path in the sky. You can also see that some days, even in January, the graph is spiky. This is because PV Watts also applies a typical weather simulation, so we can see there's the occasional cloud in January, but much more overcast weather in July. With this, and the typical power consumption of the boat that I'd measured previously, I did a very basic simulation of the battery's state of charge over the year. For January, we can expect less than 16 hours of downtime of the boat, assuming it draws a constant 35 watts. This amount of downtime increases in winter, as expected, but we could do things to compensate for this, like travel slower, or turn the Starlink off every other hour overnight, or maybe even develop an anchor so that we can use zero power to maintain position when the battery gets low. All in all, this demonstrates that it's possible to generate enough energy to make some decent progress each day. Next, to see what kind of solar panels are available which fit the size and weight constraints of the boat, plus my budget, I wanted to keep the whole solar panel assembly under 10 kilos total to keep the boat at a reasonable displacement. I also didn't want them much longer or wider than the boat. It turns out that there's flexible solar panels available now, which are ridiculously light. Compared to these similar traditional glass panels which weigh 6.6 kilos each, these can be as low as 1.6 kilograms. With no glass or frame, they might be a bit more fragile. It also means I'll have to build a frame, but aluminium is pretty light and it seems like it will fit in my weight budget. These 110 watt panels are about the length of my boat, should comfortably sit either side of the tub and are well within the weight budget. This aligns with the 200 watts from my PV watt simulation, so I ordered a pair. Next, to build a frame. I wanted to place these either side of the electronics tub in this arrangement. I could have mounted them directly on the hulls here for a lower center of gravity, but I was afraid they'd be too shaded by the tub. And solar panels really don't like being shaded, as I'll get to soon. So I started cutting the aluminium and framing up the solar panels. I wanted to check if this assembly would fit in the car before going any further, and it didn't. I decided to cut the cross members in half and bolt them back together every time I set up the boat. This arrangement fit perfectly, leaving room in the back of the car for the boat itself. I was pretty happy with the completed solar panels. They were neat and came well within the 10 kilo weight budget, weighing only 5.2 kilos total. Next, how do you convert the power generated by solar panels into something that can charge a battery? Enter the charge controller, specifically the MPPT charge controller, or Maximum Power Point Tracker. As it turns out, solar panels don't act like batteries. On the blue line here is a graph of voltage versus current for a solar cell. You can see they produce their highest voltage here at zero current, and they produce their highest current at zero voltage down here. Power is voltage multiplied by current, and is shown by the red line. When either of these is zero, power is also zero, which is useless. 
there's a sweet spot somewhere here where the current multiplied by the voltage reaches a peak power. To further complicate things, this graph changes as lighting conditions change and also with temperature. An MPPT or maximum power point tracker applies some clever algorithms to constantly find this ever-changing maximum power point and get the most out of the panel. Combined with the charge controller, it knows how to charge a lithium iron phosphate battery like this one. To find an appropriate charge controller, we use the closed circuit current and open circuit voltage of our solar panels. In this case, it was about 48 volts and 5.85 amps total for the panels in series. This Victron MPPT looks like it will do the job and even has a Bluetooth interface which I could read from the Raspberry Pi to report solar metrics right back to my controller web app. Now to put it all together and test it outside. With the solar panels, electronics, battery and charge controller all together on the lawn on a nice sunny summer day. For this time of day, PV watts estimated around 160 watts of power output. I'm getting 175 watts, which is even better than expected. As I mentioned before, solar panels tend not to like shading. You might think that shading say 10% of the panel area would drop the power output by about 10%, but no, with these panels just shading a small area of the panel plummets the power output. This is because solar panels are really an array of individual cells. If you block any individual cell in the series string of cells, that entire string's current is restricted, kind of like a blown light bulb in old incandescent Christmas tree lights. This is further aggravated by the fact that I wired these two panels in series. If one panel is slightly shaded, it affects the output of both of them. This could be mitigated by wiring the panels in parallel, but I didn't try that as I didn't expect shading to be much of an issue. Solar panels usually mitigate this by arranging the cells in such a way with bypass diodes to allow current to flow around block substrings. This can result in strange power curves with multiple local maxima, but the MPPT should be able to find the global maximum by quickly testing lots of different values. Anyway, this validated my idea to place these panels as high on the boat as possible to avoid shading, even though that might have later become the boat's undoing. I also noticed the inside of this clear tub was getting quite hot in the sun. I decided to measure the temperature and found it was quite a bit hotter inside than out. I added some reflective foil to the top of the tub to try to block the radiative heat from the sun. It's not pretty, but it seems to do the job. I also added a PTZ or pan tilt zoom camera, which would let me look around. It also records to an SD card, so I could have a copy of the footage without having to screen record from my phone the whole time. I still kept the small Raspberry Pi camera inside the electronics tub as a fallback. I tested switching between the external camera and this internal one in case the external one failed. Now to test this setup to make sure the boat still floats, doesn't immediately tip over, and all the systems work together on the water. It floated successfully and seemed reasonably stable even though it was quite windy. I measured the power consumption at various speeds and found that it was somewhat less efficient than before, but this was expected due to the increased weight and thus increased displacement and drag. A speed of 1 meter per second seemed quite efficient, consuming 30 watts of motor power. This jumped up to 72 watts for 1.3 meters per second and 200 watts for 1.5 meters per second. So I would definitely want to travel slower than 1.3 meters per second most of the time, especially considering the Starlink Mini also draws about 25 to 30 watts. There were a few more modifications to make before it was ready for the long range mission. For extra visibility, especially at night time, I added a big orange flag and an omnidirectional light. I also added contact info placards to each side in case the boat washed up somewhere and was found. The time had now come for the big long range mission. My initial plan was to completely circumnavigate Lake Alexandrina, a distance of about 100 kilometers. Assuming an average speed of 1.2 meters per second, this would be about 23 hours of travel. For safety, and to give myself a break from monitoring the video feed, and also to conserve power at night, I'd want to break this up into 9 hour days at most. So this mission would need to span 3 days and 2 nights, which I thought was maybe a bit too ambitious for its very first long range mission. After all, I had no idea how it would fare at night, especially as it would need to use its propulsion for station keeping without an anchor. So I revised the plan for this first mission. Instead, I'd set out here from Malang, travel close to the shore for about five and a half hours, and then put the boat into loiter mode to stay stationary in this sheltered area overnight. The next morning, I would retrace this path back to Malang. I monitored the weather forecast for a while, and found a day that would be both sunny for the solar panels and not too windy to avoid excessive power consumption for station keeping at night. 
I picked a day where the wind would be blowing back towards the shore in case the boat capsized or otherwise failed, and a section of the lake that looked like it would experience little to no other boat traffic. When the perfect day arrived, we set out early. The lake was beautiful and calm, it was looking like the perfect day for it. After unloading the boat from the car and setting it up on the shore, we did some test runs out in the lake. With everything looking great, I set the first waypoints of the mission. I could have planned out a full waypoint mission ahead of time, however I just wanted to monitor closely and make adjustments to the path as needed. So I just set one waypoint at a time in fairly close steps. I could also take over manual joystick control if I wanted, but setting waypoints was much less cognitive load. Because I was setting out with a mostly full battery, I adjusted the speed such that the power consumption was just under the solar power generation. This should balance out to keep the battery full until later in the day where I could reduce speed as the sun gets lower. The boat slowly disappeared as a speck in the distance, and now I had to rely on the video feed and telemetry to navigate. This all went pretty well, but I did notice it was getting choppier. On a few occasions, I slowed down as the oncoming waves were starting to crash over the bow a bit. Nonetheless, I was making good progress and on track to make the night camp location well before sunset with plenty of charge in the battery. This continued for about 2 hours, or about 9 kilometers, which was almost halfway there for the day. Suddenly, my video feed dropped out. I switched to Mission Planner on my laptop because it exposes a lot more telemetry than my custom web interface. The Starlink was still connected, and I was still receiving telemetry, which indicated that everything except the camera was working. I quickly put the boat into loiter mode so that it would stop and hold its position. Luckily I had that fallback camera inside the tub, right? So I SSH'd into the boat and worked through my previously practiced procedure of reconfiguring this as the primary camera. But it didn't work. I was trying to debug the Raspberry Pi camera and restarted the service running on the boat, but with no luck. The primary camera was connected to the Raspberry Pi via the Starlink's Wi-Fi, and it had disappeared off the list of connected devices. I was tempted to reboot the Raspberry Pi, but I didn't want to risk completely losing my telemetry and controls. I didn't want to travel blind all the way back, so I set a waypoint to head straight back to the nearest shore. This should have only taken a couple of minutes, since I was already pretty close. It was at this moment that things took an even worse turn. The artificial horizon and mission planner suddenly dipped forward and the telemetry was lost. I checked the Starlink app, and the Starlink was no longer connected to the satellite network. The video of the capsize that I showed at the start of this video was recovered from the camera's SD card later. But at the time, I had no idea what happened to the boat, and I could only hope the wind would blow it back into the shore and we'd be able to recover it. We set out to look for the boat at its last recorded coordinates. After scanning the shore, I spotted a distinct bright orange object in the distance. It was the boat, and it had washed up almost exactly where we expected it. I don't have any footage of the recovery, but we got it back home and it was in surprisingly good condition. So what happened? It's not really clear from the recovered video, but I suspect turning the boat around towards the shore made it travel in phase with the waves, which tilted it forward. The wind blowing from behind then lifted the solar panels and tilted it even further forward until it totally front flipped and capsized. As for the camera failure, considering it still managed to record the whole event to its SD card, it was still operable the whole time. I suspect the water splashing up got into the camera and covered its Wi-Fi antenna, so it still worked but had no way of transmitting that data back to the Raspberry Pi in the tub. That's a good reason to get a wired ethernet camera next time with a higher waterproof IP rating. This all made me realise I'd pushed the limits of this hull design, and it was now time to consider a redesign. I think something with a mono hull, which is arranged with a low centre of gravity and lots of buoyancy up top to make it self-riding if it ever capsizes. I'm very confident that this solar-powered, infinite-range boat concept is feasible for long-range missions. I'm already working on the new mono hull design, which I hope to test shortly. Until then, thanks for watching.